There's a bright golden haze on the meadow. There's a bright golden haze on the meadow. The corn is as high as an elephant's eye. And it looks like it's climbing clear up to the sky. Oh, what a beautiful morning. Oh, what a beautiful day. I got a beautiful feeling. Everything's going my way. Oh, what a beautiful day. It is a beautiful day, isn't it? It was some time back in the 80s, and I can't exactly remember when, but I was a counselor for senior high camp at Laurel Ridge, which is the Moravian Church Camp of the Southern Province nestled up in the North Carolina mountains. It was the first day, and there was this really loud camper who, when music started, had this magnificent singing voice. But it wasn't just there. She was loud anyway. You knew when she was going to be in the room. That was the first time that I met Jill Bowen. It was a great week at camp, and I was privileged to start getting to know this boisterous Jill person with the incredible singing voice. Then sometime in the 90s, I was the pastor of a small Moravian church here in town, and we needed an organist and a choir director, and lo and behold, Jill was available, and that was a no-brainer. She became the organist and choir director. In just a few short couple of years, she transformed that ragtag little choir group there that I was a part of, whose musical training went from a little bit to none at all, to a top-notch vocal ensemble that rivaled the big Moravian choirs in town that had many more voices and much more training. Jill was talented, of course she still is, but we're, we're talking about back then, and it wasn't just church music, she could rock and roll. Being a rocker myself, I told her more than once that she would make quite an addition to a rock band as keyboard player and vocalist, and I was thrilled to have her sing and play on one of my CDs. Well, she left Bethesda and moved on to other waters in other states, and then she met Jake, and my dream of her becoming Jill Jett disappeared. I really didn't get to be around Jake that much, but it was obvious they were smitten with each other. He was quite the gentleman. Then I felt very honored when Jill asked me to assist Bob Ryerson, her childhood pastor and my friend and colleague in performing her wedding. That was a memorable day in Tangwood Park where the wedding take place. And you can just ask her about the dog being a part of the wedding. The rest is history, as Jake was already a world-renowned opera singer and actor. Jill and Jake became fixtures in that community, performing all over the world in a number of capacities and teaching many younger aspiring singers the trade. But Jake was lost to us late last year unexpectedly, which was a tragedy to great proportions. But Jill says, today is a celebration of a life well lived, and the mood should reflect the happiness and joy that Jake brought to so many. So be it. So here we are. Welcome to the musical celebration service to honor the life and legacy of Jake Gardner. And I was asked to remind you that this service is being recorded, but it's okay to applaud. It's okay to dance in the aisles if you so choose. There will be evidence. <laughs> Let us pray. 
Loving God today is a testimony to the power of community that brings people from all over the world together to honor Jake's memory. Such love that is a reflection of your love for us all bind, uh, binds us together in unbreakable bonds of friendship, grace, mercy, love, and peace. We pray that all that is spoken, played, and sung here today will truly be a pleasing celebration of the love for Jake, love for you, O oh God, and for each other. We are thankful for your presence here among us. Amen. Let's join together in singing Jake's favorite hymn, Be Thou My Vision, that's in your leaflet, and please stand.
the blow forth soon or late, let what will be your be. Give the face of earth around and the road before me. Wealth I seek, not hope nor love, for a friend to know. Before I share a little background about Jake as a young man, I'd like to thank for the Gardner clan and the Stanhouse clan, everybody who's here, everybody who made the effort, absorbed some amazing, expenseful travel, uh, and especially to Miss Jill, who planned and organized and scheduled and rehearsed and organized. Uh, great job. <laughs> Jake was born in, in 1947 in his great grandfather's house in Oneonta, which is a huge house. It was a uh, kind of a bed and breakfast for college kids. Boarding house, I think they used to call them. So, after uh, he was born and he was still an infant, uh, Cliff and Gladys moved their family of five to Earlville. That's a cue. There we go. <laughs> I can't see it. I can't see what's going on. Um, Earlville's a sleepy little town, central New York. Um, 700 people back in 1958 and probably 600 people now in 2022. Uh, but that's, that's where it started. Gypsy was, uh, is it up? Yeah, Gypsy was, was an essential member of the family. We were kind of a subsistence group and we hunted rabbits and squirrels and pheasants all winter and Zippy was the key. Uh, that's Jake in front of the house where we grew up. It's a halfway house that was built before the Civil War. Um, I think Cliff and Gladys paid $11,000 for three acres with a big barn on it. So uh, the real cornerstone 
of our family really was Gladys. Gladys, um, I'm told, she was a, a first graduate of a local college and she taught languages, but she told her sister Marge that the only thing she really wanted to do was be a mother and she got four tries at it. Zippy was another member of the family and uh, kind of Jake's favorite. That's Natalie to his left. And uh, she was, she was a, an English Spaniel and uh, kind of a misbehavior, but we tolerated that. A fishing clan was perhaps the first time that Jake started to become an outdoorsman. Um, this motley crew was getting ready to go down to the Shenango River, which was just down across our front lawn, to catch crawdads, which we used for bait, or if we got enough, we'd eat them. Um, so Nadine, who was the last to come along after we'd moved to Earlville. It's got something in that bucket that she's proud of, but I'm not sure what it is. Uh, she's been a, a, a key figure in our family for years and years and years. Poolville Pond was <laughs> was one of our favorite treats. And when the summer, when it got a little bit, not quite as warm as here, but when it got warm and sticky, we'd get up to Poolville Pond. And that's uh, Jake expressing his joy for getting into the water. He loved the water. Um, Oswego was a kind of a treasure destination for fishing people. And uh, here's a picture of him, I think. Yeah, with a large king salmon. And uh, he, was, he was very proud of that fish. And we'd been there a little earlier, the two of us. We'd been up in St. Lawrence. We came back down to the last guy. And uh, the run was on. And so we were fortunate enough to land four salmon like this. And we looked like the guys in the, in the uh, comic books. We had a long stick with the four fish. I was on one end, he was on the other end. And the fish dragged their tails. It was quite a sight. Jake was also comfortable with boats. And on the Hudson River, That's Jill holding her breath. <laughs> and that's Jake at the oars of a little whitewater boat that uh, his nephew, Brett, and his friend Butch uh, engineered, put together, got patented, and Jake did a promotional tour. Jake and Jill did a promotional tour all over, all over the Northeast with it one summer. Nine Mile. Nine Mile is a classic holding cool on the Madison River in Yellowstone National Park. And um, he liked it there. He really loved it there. And just to illustrate what a gentleman he was and how people were attracted to his charm, I'd like to read a short letter from somebody who couldn't attend but who spent a total of five days with Jake, and then wrote this. While I won't be able to attend Jake's memorial, I just want to thank you for including me. I feel privileged to have been invited, and I will be there in spirit. I have it on my calendar, and he called me to remind me this morning. After meeting Jake so briefly on one of our Yellowstone outings, his warmth, charisma, were such a welcome addition to our group 
and his singing offered a rare insight into his chosen profession, simply magical. I feel certain that all of his friends and family will make this the memorial he so earnestly deserves, and it will be a beautiful day for all that can attend. Go in peace, knowing that Jake is surrounded by love and admiration, and will live on in the hearts of so many. My warmest regards to you. Um, Cliff and Gladys. There's a picture of Cliff and Gladys' family in their lawn furniture, which also happened to be the chairs that we had around the kitchen table. Um, but as in most families of any size, from time to time, there's some tension, you know, like tension, sisters, brothers, that sort of thing. And so um, once Jake got through high school and he went to Potsdam for a couple of years, his voice coach moved to Syracuse, he moved to Syracuse, and about two weeks before uh, he was to graduate, he was notified by the registrar that he wouldn't be graduating because he was lacking a language, a foreign language requirement. Well, he'd already been singing in three or four languages, and so he didn't think it was all that important. So after screwing up enough courage to call his father, uh, Cliff, about midnight, um, he said that, uh, said, I'm sorry I'm not going to graduate. I know he's got a lot of money invested in all, but I just don't see the point. This is midnight. By 2 o'clock, Cliff had bought a case of beer, driven to, you know, 90 miles up to Syracuse, found his apartment, case of beer, and the arguments started, left and right. Cliff, born in the Depression, said, Jake, you just need a fallback position if this whole opera thing doesn't work out. And so um, Jake argued the other side of it. And the closing and convincing argument was won by him about four o'clock when he said, he said, Dad, when you go to the Met to see people perform and you open the program, it doesn't say, you know, trained at <laughs> Trained at Potsdam, schooled at Syracuse, and uh, graduated from college. It doesn't say that at all. All it says is such and such performed such and such a role in such and such a place in such and such a time. <clears throat> and the people who know opera obviously are convinced that that's, this guy has this stuff. And so he said, I made my choice. I don't see this as necessary. And guess what? Things really fall apart. I can always go back and get my degree. Um, he never did have to go back. Um, he's come a long way. And from this beginning, <laughs> this humble, 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 humble beginning in central New York, um, to use a line from one of my favorite movies um, called Jeremiah Johnson. Jeremiah's walked up the hill. He's a little, you know, kind of a, a new uh, mountain man. And he's up at the top, and he's way up there in the tree line. And Johnson is cooking a rabbit. And here's this old guy with all his hair and nails, and his name is Grizz. He chased Grizz Bears. And so <clears throat> as they were, Grizz was watching him with the rabbit, he says, you've come far, Pilgrim. You've come far, Jake. You've come far, Opera Man. And that's the truth because the end of this story uh, took place in Carnegie Hall. I was fortunate enough to be there he invited us all. I sat next to Cliff, my father, 
And Jake and Richard Taylor sang a famous duet from Pearl Fisher's. Cliff is sitting there, he is smiling, he is just beaming. And they hadn't talked for a few years. You know, like, bad move, Jake. And so Cliff leans over, he says, I think Jake made the right decision. <laughs> and so, um, before I close, I'd like to close with just a couple of comments. Um, Jake's family remember him as kind and gentle, uh, outdoorsman, talent whose passion for music, singing, acting, inspired him to a long and glorious career. And uh, I think he was a man who lived life in a state of well-being. Not an easy road away from family for all those years and back and forth. But he enjoyed it. He just enjoyed it. Um, so let me close. And I don't want to offend anybody by maybe getting a little woo-woo here. But uh, we were in Aspen listening to a rehearsal of their uh, orchestra, 120 pieces, in a big tent, with maybe the same number of people we have here. And he played the first part, Tchaikovsky, and then he played the second part, and there was nobody over to the right of me, but all of a sudden I felt a sense. You know how you feel a sense if somebody's in the room or not? I felt a sense. And I looked over, and there's a hologram just like that, to the nail, right down to the T. He looked over me and said, as if to say, see what I mean? And so I take away from that little story is I think I need to start listening to far more uh, opera and grand music and a little less jazz. <laughs>